All right, you good. All right, just wanted to finish up a couple of slides from the uh, last lecture. Uh, refractive index, basically, it's a measure of the ratio of the speed of light in air divided by the speed of light in your medium that you're measuring. And uh, so, for example, for glass, uh, it's 3.8 times 10 to the 8 over 2 times 10 to the 8, so it's refractive index is 1.5. This is for water, this is for ice. If you put solutes into the solution, then that will change the refractive index. So what they have done is basically made up uh, instruments that fit different categories. In there. So if you want one for uh, sugar solution or want one for maple syrup, things like that, uh, they're, they, they're very specific things. So here, for example, is glycerol, glycerin, uh, the weight uh, percentage going from here from zero up to 20. And as you see, they, they actually uh, do it by uh, five decimal places, 1.33303. I'm, I'm not sure that you can actually measure it to that degree there. But you see it goes from 1.33 to 1.357, not a very big change, over 20%. Uh, and, that, and that's one of the problems with something like this, is that uh, you have to be very careful. So here's BRICS. What is BRICS? It's a hmm? concentration of sugar in the solution. Sugar, right, it's for sugar. It's for sucrose. Okay. I've seen people use BRICS for mixtures of three different sugars, and that's meaningless. You have to actually have, you know, a, a standard curve for doing something like that. And they're nice. They're very small. You put a drop of the liquid on it, and you get the measurement. Uh, here's things, uh, applications for the different models. Uh, and they even have it for jams, marmalades, for uh, coffee, juice, ketchup. Obviously, with ketchup, you're going to have to dilute it a bit uh, so that it's going to work in there because of all the uh, solids that are in there. So all different kinds of things. I think that was the last thing. Oh, one other way to do it is by measuring freezing point. Uh, and this is a good way for measuring the water activity of uh, high moisture gels, because uh, this is a very, very sensitive to uh, four decimal places in there. It's typically used in the dairy industry to check whether a farmer has diluted the milk and added salt into it. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a, a nice way to catch, catch up on it. The accuracy in the instrument is 0 0.001 degrees centigrade. Uh, there is a standard for milk that it should be 0 0.0055, but uh, we had a uh, professor oh, 40 years ago here, he did a study on uh, measurement of freezing point of milk. From here, there was one hypothesis that uh, in the winter time, the freezing point of milk of cows here is going to be different than cows down in Florida. <laughs> and there was absolutely no correlation whatsoever in doing that. OK, Pam? That's it. Yeah. Now we're going to be talking about A sub W, how to measure it. Uh, did, you, did they do that today? They did. Yes, okay. they did. We're done with Moisture Lab. Uh, this license plate almost got me in jail. Okay. I have it on one of my sports cars, and uh, I went to a meeting in uh, Switzerland. My wife was at a meeting in China, and my son, that was during spring break, uh, my son uh, went down to drink a lot down in Texas. Here. And the car sat outside, it had these plates on it. And when I got back, I noticed that the plates were gone. And so I called the sheriff. Uh, uh, we used the Ramsey County Sheriff's for Badness Heights. And the guy came and then he says, uh, You were with an African American guy in this car and you stole gas from a gas station. And I'm saying, What? You know? And I said, you up, and I'll show you on my passport where I was. And my wife is not here, my son is down in Texas. 
And so it's, somebody took the plates. And maybe they took the car first and then brought the car back. I don't know, it just didn't make any sense at all. And uh, so I had to go to a new place. They said, you know, in about a year you could change them. So about a year later, I changed the plates. My both boys were away in college. They came back at spring break. And uh, so I, about two days beforehand, I got, decided to try to start up the car and drive it around with a big old And uh, it started, it was chugging and you know, not doing very well. And so I pulled back in, and as I was doing this, a police car went by, because they patrolled there. And uh, I was ready to get out of the car, and all of a sudden there were two police cars with sirens going, and one of them was out there with a gun pointing at me in the car. Okay? And they, uh, I have a bad back, and they said, uh, do not get out of the car, roll down the window. Okay? Now you can slowly get out of the car, and I almost fell doing that. And they said, walk to the back of the car. They put my hands up on the, over the trunk, put my hands on the back window, and then pulled them back and cuffed them. What the hell is going on? <laughs> and uh, I mean, obviously, what happened? They didn't know that the license plate was allowed again, and so they maybe caught this. Uh, uh, I finally convinced them. But I don't put it on my car anymore. <laughs> I just don't need that. So we talked this about this before. We can either plot a moisture versus water activity. We get this kind of curve, or we can plot it as moisture content versus water activity, and we get uh, a sigma shape curve. Leonardo da Vinci actually designed the first humidity cage in there. Uh, he was very interested in that. Uh, he basically uh, took a human hair, uh, put a, a, a spring on it, and that was connected to a uh, arrow, and he had a scale going from zero to 100%, and they measured humidity in there. Uh, because as the humidity goes up, this string was actually black hair from uh, Italian women on the uh, in an island near Sicily that was very straight and very thick and very uniform. He made about 100 of these devices, sold it around. Uh, all of Europe in doing that. And we, for many, many years, and uh, if you want to see one, I have one in my office. Uh, basically, this is what it looks like. This is the hair there. And now it's basically a nylon, a synthetic hair that they use for it. So it's uh, very, very uniform. And this one is a clock that you wind up with a circular uh, thing so you can get the humidity over time for one week. It's a seven-day uh, rotation around there. Uh, the Navy used this for many, many years for doing that. The error is about plus or minus 5% relative humidity, which is pretty big. No, it's not, not that good. And at the extremes, it's not linear. So it's relying on that the uh, elasticity is a, is a linear function of humidity, but uh, at the end, it, it is not. Uh, there's a way you can make one for yourself, and there's the instructions for it if you want to uh, try to make one. And hopefully you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend who has long, straight hair. Yours looks pretty good. <laughs> maybe you want to lend some out. Pull one out of everything. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of certified humidity gauges that are done very, very well, they, the way they put them together. They cost about $250, and that's for mainly in uh, uh, warehouses where you want storage. Uh, this is an example of one here. Unfortunately, it was dropped a couple of times, and so the humidity doesn't work on it. The temperature part works pretty well, but it doesn't. There's two little screws that are in there, and I don't know how they got in there. But something, something broke in that. The in Germany, they came up with this idea, which I thought was pretty good. Here's my sample in here. These are gummy water. This has been in here for three years, so it's, they're hard as bricks, and they're not really gummy anymore, as you can see. 
They're glassy. <laughs> and uh, basically the mechanism is behind there. The same type of mechanism with a fiber on it. Uh, many industrial humidity controlling devices, instead of using just a fiber, they'll use a ribbon uh, that goes over two rollers. And so the rollers pulls it apart. And, uh, and it's a, it's a, those you can get very precise, down to maybe a half a percent relative humidity. In it. But uh, it's, this is just too small for doing this. Uh, FDA actually uh, has bought these. Uh, it's made in Germany, and they uh, send it around. Uh, I mean, they use it for uh, uh, when they're going into a food plant for inspection where water activity might be an important thing. We can pass that around. Pass it back here. This one here, you can pass it back too if you want to see it. So that's called the Luft hygrometer, hygrometer, not hygrometer, like we talked with water. And it's good to 0.01 water activity. And it's calibrated in the 0.7 to 1 range, basically, uh, on it, although you can't get it at lower values in there. Uh, FDA did a big test of 24 labs that was part of that. Uh, the, um, the value was 0.83 plus or minus 0.008 with a range of 0.816 to 0.863. That's a pretty big range. Uh, 0.85 is part of the low acid canned food regulation. So if you are heat treating something that's non-acid, uh, and its water activity is above 0.85, then you have to give it a kill for clustering botulinum spores. I think you, you may have learned that in micro or not. No? Nobody? Uh, so I would worry about using that in a plant where the range can be this much, and uh, uh, that, that puts it at, at uh, uh, risk. Uh, there is the um, Canadian government has put together a brochure on method for determining water activity in foods with the fine limits of crystal. Oh wait, this one. Methods are determined using the Luft meter. That's what what that uh, device is. Luft from Germany. Another way to do that, and this. Oh, this instrument is banned in the university because it's got two mercury thermometers on it. Uh, I uh, didn't, I forgot to bring my piece of uh, shoelace, but if you take a white shoelace and wet it, you put it over uh, this one here, and this one is dry, so you have a, a dry bulb and a wet bulb. And so you stand there and swing this. <laughs> Dangerous, right? You, drunken Navy men were doing this, and they went through a lot of these. There's still a lot of mercury around. So what, what the hell can I do with this? How, how do I get the relevant humidity? Well, well, we'll talk about that. It's very important. That's part of the graph that you have there. So air water properties. H is usually used as pounds of water per pound of dry air. It's an Italian word for moisture. Uh, relative humidity, as we know, is P over P naught times 100. And that's related to the mass from the gas equation, PV equals nRT. And uh, we can, then P really is uh, this, and that gives you C times the mass, which is a good thing. So here is a. Uh, Psychometric chart. On your psychometric chart, you have a point at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's that little circle there. And those lines, I show this as curves here. This graph is a very short piece of temperature. So you can make it sort of linear for humidity. And if you look at the uh, the light dotted straight lines that are up, going up at an angle. And you'll see about oh, three quarters of the way to the right, uh, you can see the numbers going 
from 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. That's around the humidity line. And those are basically straight there. It really is somewhat of a curve in that. So if we have the air temperature, and that's the dry bulb, and what your finger? What does it do when you spin it? No, well it does dry. What else does it do? It cools down. Okay. There are curved lines that are, and these are these lines here that are also dotted. Those are the lines uh, which we call adiabatic cooling. That there's a a cooling process that goes on that all the heat goes into evaporating water, and as long long as it stays wet enough it'll always be at some temperature and that's the temperature at the end this line here is 100 percent relative humidity so what it says is i wet something and i spin it around i'm going to cool that surface the water's going to that be evaporating but it's going to be evaporating at a temperature that's way below the temperature of the sample this is the beauty of spray drying. Because we can have uh, the, the droplets dry in the first three or four seconds, and the surface is wet. So they actually dry at the uh, wet bulb temperature. And so you can design your spray dryer so you can spray dry microorganisms like yogurt uh, uh, cultures, stuff like that, with maybe getting one mod cycle still. Yeah, a pretty good. Uh, process itself, even though the temperature of the particle is maybe 80 or 90 degrees centigrade, uh, you know, from the uh, from the air around it. So here's the problem: is you got to have good thermometers. If you have a thermometer with markings of delta two, and I don't know what happened there, this moved around. Okay, uh, and you measure something that's at 76 percent relative humidity at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it uh, uh, will be the answer you would get is somewhere between 46 to 93 percent relative humidity. Not very good. Not very good. That's the delta for looking at a delta of two. If you go down to 0.05 Fahrenheit, uh, then you get these numbers are pretty good. Now, if it was let's say 10 percent at uh, relative humidity at 138 Fahrenheit, you'd get a number between. 9 to 11, which is not too bad in there. Uh, so accuracy of the thermometer is very important. Uh, a lot of the uh, walk-in chambers in the, in the BSL-2 lab and some of the chambers over in uh, food science, uh, they have humidity controllers on them, and they use wet bulb, dry bulb. On it. So they put, instead of a mercury thermometer, they put thermocouples, one wet, one dry. And I, I don't think the wet bulb thing has ever been filled up after about 10 years. It's just uh, nobody's even looked at it. So it's not, good. why would you want to have humidity control inside the, uh, inside the walking? Yeah? Control growth of certain mechanisms based on the Well, it's, it's to ensure that it's humid enough Okay. That because if it was dry, then the the uh, petri dishes will lose void moisture, and that that's, that would not be good. There is even there's about ten different companies out there with electronic ones that uh, you just put a probe in, and there's a little fan that blows the, the uh, air over a wet pour some water into the chamber. Uh, it works that way from doing it. Uh, this one is not too bad. They, this one they call a digital sling psychrometer because that's what this is called a sling psychrometer uh, because you're slinging it around basically. <coughs> there are some kiss messages, very simple for people who can't afford. I helped a number of countries come up with met with methods for doing that. Oh, we walked up here. There we go. Uh, Landrock Proctor, uh, two faculty members at MIT came up with this method in 51. Four desiccators with soil solutions around what you 
think the water activity is. And in, uh, if two of them have water activities lower than uh, the sample, then the sample will lose water. And if you have two that's higher, the sample will gain moisture. So this is the delta water change. And so you just draw straight lines and then take the average in between, and that would be close to the water activity. Uh, this is uh, also called the FET loss procedure. Uh, two former students of mine that were at Pillsbury did this work. And they came up with another one. Uh, they said, let's use the food as a salt solution. So we're going to take a desiccator and put 100 grams of food in it. So these are small desiccators. And then we're going to take some dry standard material. In this case, we used microcrystalline cellulose that was always kept over dryer right. So it was very dry. And you would put two samples of that in there, weigh them before, weigh it after. You know how much moisture it picked up. And then you would have a standard curve for the moisture content versus water activity of the cellulose. And that would be the, you know, you assume that it's going to have the same water activity as the food. And so uh, you can read it off that graph. And it works pretty well. It's, a, it's an easy method. Uh, another one is uh, putting a drop of glycerol in a chamber with the food. And the glycerol will pick up moisture from the food, equilibrate, and then you measure the refractive index of the drop and, uh, uh, for water glycerol. And uh, then you can get the water activity of it from this, from this table. Now, back when I first started working in this area, there were no instruments. And I think the, the first instrument came out about 1958 when I uh, uh, just started uh, at MIT. Uh, and what they did is they took a fiber and they soaked it in a certain salt solution so you could get different ranges, dried the fiber out, so it's got the salt in it now. And instead of measuring elasticity, you pass either a direct current or a AC current through it, and you measure impedance or conductance on that. And so you, make, you can make a scale for the current that's going through and that would give you the water activity on a scale in there. So you put the food sample, let me just show you, you put the food sample in this jar. This is the uh, sensor. It's hooked up to a, uh, a reading machine. No, no digital output at those times. It was basically a dial in there and that would tell you the water activity. So here's a good one because it's got, it's got a small range uh, of relative humidity, but it's very steep, so you have to, uh, uh, you get a big change in impedance uh, per amount of water activity that's in there. And so that's something we want, and you can have a whole set of different uh, uh, probes to get the water activity range that is going to work for you in there. Uh, this is a pope, and that's more uh, above about 50% relative humidity. Uh, it stretches out here. There's not much change in the resistance, so it gets less sensitive to it, where this has got good sensitivity there. And that's a polysulfonate uh, polymer. There were three companies that got into this to try to improve on this. One of them was Votronics. They were a Swiss company. Uh, there was a Swiss, uh, another Swiss company that started making sensors. And so they didn't, Rotronics didn't uh, make their own sensor. They just bought this one. And here's our chamber here. Uh, you put the food in the chamber, screw it up into here. And this actually has uh, a, a water jacket around it so you can do it at different temperatures. So you get the uh, water activity change as a function of temperature in it. And it was one of the first ones that had a digital output, uh, both the temperature and the relative humidity. They said that you get an answer in about five minutes. Uh, I found out 
that was probably better to let it equilibrate for more than 10 hours. Okay. Uh, not very good from that. Uh, another thing is the sensors get poisoned from the volatile material that's in the food. And so their calibration changes over time. And so you always got to do some uh, standard comparison when you measure water activity of food. At the same time, you measure water activity of two standards to see if they are still uh, with the same equation for that. Uh, Nova Sina made a more interesting looking device. Uh, and, and it had nice polished steel on the outside, so it looked beautiful. And so the microbiologists thought that it was a better instrument. But it actually used exactly the same sensor as the uh, other one did. Uh, this one had a setup so you could put eight to 10 samples in, in different bays in there and do them uh, over time in there. Uh, both of these instruments, when they first came out, cost around $10,000. Uh, so it was pretty good money for a very cheap thing to make in there. Uh, the uh, cost today is about $20,000 for them, so they're not cheap in there. So, but if you are dealing in semi-moist or dry foods, this is something you've got to have. Got to have doing that. We have a lot of people from the industry who come over and measure uh, their water activity, their product in our lab. And um, it's good because uh, my fee is they take me and my students out to lunch at any place I select. And again, uh, the Canadian government has put together uh, for the uh, Nova Sina, and that would be true for the uh, Rotronics as well, a, a um, standard methodology of doing it. The, um, I, I said 10 hours, it, it can be up to 18 hours for it to equilibrate. So that's one of the real problems in it. The sensor to air volume is very important. So the lower the amount of air space you have in there, uh, the faster it's going to equilibrate. And that's, that's a critical thing. And it's good to point all one water activity. But you've got to standardize it uh, every time. Uh, this is what FDA switched to. Fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> it's a calculator, right? But it basically, it's the same thing as uh, the Rotronics. It's uh, a impedance device, or electronic device, uh, but they miniaturize it. Okay. Uh, very, very uh, important thing. Uh, this was made by a company called Decagon. Uh, they've changed their name twice. Uh, they changed it to Aquasorb along the way, and uh, I learned at uh, the IFT meeting that they had now changed the name of their company to Meta, which I think is stupid. <laughs> but they gave, they, they've given me every instrument they've ever invented in there. Uh, uh, the founder of the company was an ag engineering, and he developed, and that's where the word Decagon, he had, uh, he had a uh, wet bulb dry bulb device, electronic one, that had 10 bays on it, so it was in the shape of a decagon, and that's where the decagon name came from. Uh, that didn't sell very well, but this is, this is a very simple instrument. It comes with a little uh, kit. Uh, it's got it's got a cup. You can use either a metal cup or a plastic cup. Um, and these are easier, you can throw them out, you don't have to worry about them, they're cheaper. And then it also has little bottles, vials in here with uh, salt solutions, so you can run the standard in there. So FDA uses this when they go out instead of the Novacina device. I mean, uh, the uh, uh, Luft device. And it's much more uh, logical. There are Sensors for very low relative humidities that are very sensitive. It's basically phosphorus pentoxide embedded into a fiber. 
and the phosphorus pentoxide is a very, very good absorber of water. And so uh, you can measure it again. It's, uh, instead of using these other kinds of, uh, typically they use either sodium chloride or lithium chloride in those fibers uh, to make them to different ranges itself. And this one uses phosphorus pentoxide. Why are we not moving? You got stuck? Yeah. Let me just hit this arrow. There we go. AOAC, American uh, Association of, uh, was it, uh, oh, AO. Hmm? What is it, Pam? What's that? AOAC. American Association. Uh, no, not American. Association, Association of, of Analytical, Analytical Communities, I think right. that's what it is, right? Communities, yeah. Uh, okay. So they have a procedure that's in uh, their section 32 for vegetables, uh, processed vegetables, uh, in canning, basically. And again, that's where they're trying to see if its water activity is greater than 0.85. Well, I can chew on it and I can tell you it's going to be better than A5. And uh, they have not updated this for almost 30 years. So it's out of date. A lot of the instruments don't even exist anymore for it. And uh, it does give you the standardization. So using the Greenspan, there's a, uh, a table for about 40 different salts that can give you different uh, water activities and they've got it at about 15 different temperatures. So it's a, it's a good thing for it. When we do a calibration curve, we usually use five salt solutions. Uh, and uh, the sample has got to be about 95% of the total volume of the space in there. And we record the AW over time. It usually takes maybe about 15 minutes, but you report it to 0.01. Uh, so that's, that's in the 21 CFR re reference. Uh, they have to uh, this thing. Now, the neat thing that went on in the uh, uh, late 70s was people decided we could get more precise by doing dew point instead of. Uh, and uh, how many of you have experienced dew point in your bathroom? Hmm? Condensation on the windows. You take the window and it's chilled from the outside. At some point, you're going to get uh, either ice or you get just water forming, liquid water forming on it. Uh, so what they did, and this was Decagon, uh, they took and made a, use a Peltier device. Peltier device is the reverse of a, of a thermocouple device. It's dissimilar metals, you put a current through it and it will generate a specific temperature. So you can get different temperatures by depending on what current you put through this. And so you can use that to very slowly change the temperature of your sample. Your sample is going to be sitting in here, uh, in this space here, okay, and uh, uh, or you can have a flow of air coming from the sample going through here. And as you cool down, at some point, uh, water is going to condense on the surface. And that's going to change the intensity. You've got a light bulb here shining on the surface. It's a mirror surface. And so it <clears throat> reflects back here. And this can sense when uh, 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 the water is condensing on the surface. And so it, uh, it does that. Uh, very, very simple type of device uh, for doing that. And um, the one that you use, they use a Decagon, right? You want it today? Yeah, I use the Aqua Lab CX2. CX2, okay. Uh, that's what that instrument does. And in fact, it will equilibrate uh, in between five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a very fast sample. They, uh, they have newer ones, and if you, uh, want to see it, you can just visit my lab. Uh, they have one that you can use to generate the whole isocurve. So you put your sample in it, you dry your sample down, uh, put your sample in it, and it 
goes in 5% or 3% relative humidities and lets it equilibrate, measures weight time. And once it equilibrates, then it makes the next step. But it'll generate a whole isotherm. Uh, takes three days to do that. And you're only doing one sample in there. Uh, the, that, that's, a, that's a problem. Uh, and the, comp the com competition is that you uh, put it in desiccators. You know, and you can put, you can put uh, five or six different samples in each desiccator, uh, weigh it once, and then wait three weeks, and then weigh it again. Uh, takes time weighing. This one, you don't have to weigh it, but you generate the whole isotherm, which is a nice thing to have uh, for a, as a quality standard. <clears throat> so here, if we take that thing on the psychrometric chart, uh, the green line, uh, the red line going to the left is if we took this sample at this moisture content and we cooled it down without changing the water content, when we reach the dew point, water would condense here. And that's essentially what's going on in this. So the psychrometric chart is, is, uh, tells you what's happening. And uh, basically, the, the device has built into it, uh, in the uh, memory, all the algorithms needed to calculate what the, what the uh, humidity is. It's, it's basically this whole chart in electronic form uh, inside the uh, device. So you don't have to do the calculation yourself. Yeah, yeah there's, there's the one that you use, the CX2, five minutes of equilibration. And there's what we, I've shown you this point going over here, read the dew point here. So that would give you, what you do is then take, you've got the, uh, uh, moisture content, I mean, the temperature the sample is at, uh, and its relative humidity, let's say its uh, uh, relative humidity was 0.9%, then you go down there, and so the instrument is basically taking the dew point and this temperature and back calculating what the relative humidity is going to be. A very, very simple thing. Uh, problems is dust and volatiles condensing on the mirror. So that's going to change the freezing point. In there. Um, low sensitivity at low vapor pressure, generally under 10%. It's not going to be very good. So you need to clean the surface. Uh, they, when they first started, they had a fan to do mixing in there. It's sealed, so you're not going to lose moisture, but they found that the, the fan was too high and it would blow, especially if you had power to it, would blow power all over and destroy the uh, mirror's sensitivity. So that was not good. And you can see with salt solutions, uh, we can get a very, very nice uh, calibration between the, the salt solution and the instrument on there. And that, that's an important thing to have, especially now with FDA wanting uh, you to have prevention programming. Definitely, if it's water activity, you need to have some kind of standard uh, in there and how, how often you recalibrate it so you verify it. So, uh, Again, Canada has done a, a paper on this uh, for getting uh, the, for the Aqualab CX2 that we use today. There are several other competitors in the, in the field for doing isotherms. Uh, this is DBS. This is a big device. It's uh, in the lab uh, uh, where you've got uh, Dr. Vickers and uh, uh, Dr. Charlie Chi, uh, and then a third room, third door there, and it's in, in that room there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Renixius used this for looking at uh, flavor volatile loss and gain uh, over time in there. Costs about $200,000. It's not cheap. Desiccators are cheaper. And uh, you can make it even cheaper. You can make it even cheaper. What we use a lot, if we're going to do a lot of samples, we use fish tanks. Okay? And uh, build a little platform to raise it above this, the solution. And you can get them at Walmart for a good price. And, uh, not, not, a, not a bad all thing. The only thing you have to do is you've got to get some plexiglass and cut it to, fit, to cover the, the tank in there. 
This is the first uh, one that Decagon made. Okay. So this is this does sorption isotherm. You put that. This is just light shining. That's not uh, that's not dirt on there, her flower, or whatever. Uh, what does that shape or that instrument remind you of? A what? Camera? Oh, maybe. It's like a bread maker. Huh? It's like a bread maker. Bread maker? <laughs> a robot head? It's, it's a what? A robot's head. A robot's head? The guy uh, who was the engineer who designed this uh, collected old cars from the 40s and 50s and 60s. And then they had that rounded, they had those colors, stuff like that. And you go to Cuba and you see them all around. And that's it. He designed it that way. Uh, so it looks like a car. <laughs> People didn't like that. They wanted to look, something to look more scientific. So this is their new one, <laughs> which you can use for measuring both water activity uh, mode and you also have moisture sorption isotherm mode in there. And it works pretty well. We, we, we've been very happy with it. The, the, first, the first one that I showed you there, uh, the first three they gave me didn't work. And it, it just was not, not the right design on it. And so uh, they did a lot of improvements in this one here. Uh, so here's, here's the water supply that passes through. And then, as I said, it, it equilibrates at a certain relative humidity, measures the relative humidity, and then goes to the next step, next step, next step. And they just use more water to get into the headspace to do that. So, you can get five gram sample, so you can have a heterogeneous sample and grind it up. It allows for initial drying and uh, it's blowing humid air over the sample until you reach a certain thing and then they actually measure the relative humidity with a dew point device that's built in to the instrument itself. So that's why you can use it for water activity measurement. Problem is $30,000. Not, not cheap. But you know, here is uh, the, let's see, which is my static, oh, oh, yeah. This is using the desiccator, and this is two runs on using the aqua soil in there. You see down here, it's pretty bad, but on these ends, it's not, not too bad. Uh, this was for whole uh, flaked uh, cereal in there, a plain flake. This was for the same cereal, but now ground up. So you had more surface area, right? and then uh, less thickness, and so it could equilibrate better. And as you see now, you get it pretty good, except for uh, this uh, one is, I don't remember what this one is, the green one here. You can't do that thing. This is for gum arabic, and not too bad, although uh, it go goes through this. The pink things here are the static desiccator, uh, and this is uh, the adsorption isotherm, and this is the desorption isotherm, so you get this weird thing that's occurring somewhere around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 water activity. I think it's probably due to last transition phenomenon taking place that, in there. What is really nice is you can do double questions measurement. Uh, when when we end? In five minutes. Five minutes. So you can put crystals in there, and what you'll see, the crystals won't absorb moisture until they reach a point where water will condense on the crystal and start dissolving it in there. Uh, so this is uh, sodium potassium chloride here. Uh, this is the X's are sodium chloride and a mixture of them, 50-50 blend, uh, actually delquoises at a lower water activity than the two of them. So that says if you, you make, let's say, a vitamin mix with crystalline vitamin, crystalline X, crystalline Y, whatever, uh, the actual water activity where it will deliquesce, and this is something you don't want to happen in your product. Uh, because now it's going to grab water and screw up the whole sample. Uh, the actual water activity, if you take the water activity of the two or three or four, whatever, multiply and times each other, 
you get pretty close what uh, the uh, instrument shows. And that come, actually comes from thermodynamics. It gives the Lewin relationship, which I won't go through because it's about five pages of, of equations to solve it. Uh, and then freezing point, we can do that as well. Uh, we, we can convert freezing point to modality and then use Routes law, which I talked about in food chemistry, uh, to calculate what the water activity would be. And that's the equation. That's there. It's so simple. Right? And then NMR, IR, you can do just like for moisture, you can do uh, met, uh, measurements in the, either the NMR range or the IR range and uh, then make a standard curve. And now they have a new instrument that could go on. They have an instrument that instead of using dew point, they use a laser uh, in the uh, near infrared range that they pass through the airspace above the sample as it's equilibrating. And so they can choose a, the water uh, uh, frequency and you can now make it make it read in terms of water activity because you can convert that into water content and then you know, uh, relative vapor pressure water activity. Uh, the problem is that you know it's different it's actually measuring the OH bond and so if you have ethanol in your sample then it's going to volatilize a bit that's going to cause some problems or glycerol or propylene glycol, anything that's a volatile that has an OH group on it is going to, and so some flavors as well uh, would would uh, interfere, and so that's one real problem that we have. All right. Good. All right. See you guys on Friday.